Okay, hi, uh, thanks for coming this evening. Um, so, just before we get started, just wanted to uh, thank Chelsea and Gillian from the Women's Library for collaborating in this event. And also, thanks to the podium to a fellow in City Design and Social Sciences at LSE, she's going to be chairing the session. Tina's research is using interdisciplinary social science and architectural methods to understand how culture, geopolitics, and colonization are embedded in from an academic perspective. Um, I finally want to thank panelists and the people that are going to facilitate the breakout session. Um, and we're looking forward to a really interesting conversation. What flows from that? So, uh, my name is Jenny Savage, and I'm a researcher and urban designer. Um, I've been writing a strategy and design guidance in Power Hamlets on gender inclusivity for the last few years. Um, and I started thinking about this question of kind of gender and the built environment about 15 years ago, whilst I was writing an elective for students at Chelsea called Reading the City. And I was really interested in how the city is a kind of living archive um, and that as we're kind of using the city or passing through the city, there's a kind of intersection between our own personal experience, our personal stories and narratives or association. And then what the city is kind of transmitting to us through that. So it's a place where this kind of very personal stories and, and inner life meets with the um, kind of much more political, politicized space, but it's also something that's kind of transmitting power. And whilst I was writing this elective, I don't know if it, it was a bit slow on the uptake, <laughs> it suddenly dawned on me that everybody who had built that city or designed the city or paid for the city was a man. And not only were they a man, but they were a man from a very particular class, very particular background, very particular kind of way of being in the world. And that this goes back a thousand years in history. And um, I started to wonder how, what's the impact of this kind of minority of people having such a massive impact on our like day-to-day -day lives? And that, you know, the city kind of, you know, that we've kind of inherited this sort of legacy of this built environment, which is really kind of infused with all of these structures, all of these conversations that people have had, and that women's voices have really been omitted from that. And what does that impact, you know, how does that impact us as we're kind of walking around? And incidentally, I don't think there's any men. <laughs> So, um, and I think this is really important because the built environment is the re relational frame through which we experience everything. It's where we grow up, it informs our childhood, it informs our kind of day to day interactions with people, whether we're meeting someone on the street or kind of, you know, whatever we're doing, we're kind of doing it in collaboration with the built environment that we've not been part of making. So we're looking at this kind of explicit landscape, which is what we see around us, but then also the kind of implicit landscape, which is the conversation that we have with ourselves. And um, and we've not been part of that kind of process. So to so <laughs> forward a few years and a kind of really kind of funny career trajectory that I've had, and I found myself in the planning policy team at Tower Hamlets, uh, writing gender inclusive design policy uh, or evidence-based supporting policy um, in the planning policy team. Um, and when I started this project, the focus was very much on women's safety. And from the outset of the project, I questioned this notion of, kind of women's safety as something that should be the focus. Because given all that I'd kind of already thought about in terms of how women had been excluded from these spaces. Um, why are we only talking about safety? 
And any time we have the opportunity to talk about women, women's experience in the city, we automatically talk about safety. And I've kind of come to believe that that is also a form of sexism in and of itself. Um, and that it's limiting the input that we can have and our experience can have on how cities are planned and designed in the future. So um, with this in mind, I set about kind of co-writing this design guidance and I worked with about 500 women and girls across Tower Hamlets in order to kind of understand what their perspectives were uh, in terms of the city. And of course, if you talk to a woman who's walking down the street with a child and you talk to her about street safety, she's not talking to you about someone jumping out from behind a bush. She's talking about pollution and her kids having to walk close to the road or how annoying it is to walk to school every day and all of these kinds of things. But they're not, these questions are not being included because we're so obsessed with talking about safety. So with this in mind, I have not used the word safety in my document and I'm focused on using the word welcoming. Because if you think in design terms, if we talk about designing for safety, we're talking about what we take away. So we get rid of benches, we get rid of plants, <laughs> bushes, trees, everything. We end up with this kind of desolate environment that is really harshly lit. If we talk about welcoming spaces and creating welcoming spaces, what we're talking about is layering public space with multiple activity. We're focusing on kind of in creating intergenerational space bringing in community and strengthening community, and that that welcoming space will actually make people feel safer. So, at the same time that I was working on this project in Tower Hamlets, Marina was working on a parallel project, and actually she's been working much longer on it at LLDC, and we have been talking kind of regularly throughout the course of our <laughs> things, mainly going to <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but actually, like Marina's written this amazing handbook for creating spaces for women and girls, and um, we kind of felt like we would like to organise this event this evening because we wanted to share what we've been learning with a broader audience than a kind of planning audience, and we would like to open up the discussion and just kind of introduce the idea that actually things could look different and try and imagine what that might be. So I'm going to hand over to Marina now before we hand over to our panel. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, uh, Penny, um, for, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just a very quick one to also to echo uh, Janice. Thank you to all of you today for um, caring about this topic. So mm -hmm. thanks a lot for uh, being here. Can introduce me, so I'll run through that um, a little bit faster. I'm a landscape architect and urban designer by background, and yeah, for the past three and a half years, I've been looking at the topic um, of gender equality in urban design and planning um, for mayoral development organization, where I still currently work as a team lead in planning policy. And I was kind of like really moved, obviously, and got very passionate about like the topic because I felt how is it possible that as a professional, I never thought about myself as a person or never dared to bring my experiences into, but then I also thought, well, these are also just my experiences. So how do we then account for, um, you know, the actually kind of like a people center um, design of places where we actually walk the walks with people understand um, who is occupying the places, how those places feel like, and then mainstream that into planning and the policy. And this is where, um, the work that um, I did over the three years culminated in the handbook that uh, Jenny mentioned, which is kind of like a really looking to mainstream uh, into designing and policy um, experiences of women and, um, and, and girls and gender diverse people, and actually of all of those who voices often have not been at the table when we were designing uh, for, for them. Um, I always like to start with the positive and be optimistic and keep it on that uh, note. And I think over the past couple of years, also as Jenny mentioned, and she mentioned her work, we've seen a lot of amazing work being done in the sphere of uh, gender equality in urban design and planning. Um, I think only in the past two weeks, we've seen uh, three amazing publication of three amazing documents, including uh, Jenny's work, um, Mayor of London, have also uh, done uh, quite interesting and really robust study 
and uh, people in private industry are also thinking, um, and that was about focusing on very important aspects, which is transport and gender equality or inequality, but let's yeah, keep it on the positive. Um, POFAS in the room were also uh, part of the London um, Assembly Committee meeting, where we were essentially kind of like a sharing our uh, knowledge and informing directly um, the future decisions of the of the mayor. And we most recently also heard the commitment from the, the uh, well the the, the the mayor's office that this is going to be embedded into the iteration of the London plan. For those known planners in the room, the London plan is kind of like the, the holy document that we have to follow when we are doing any decision and when we are creating the plan. So that's a very, very kind of like a positive news. But I think there is still a lot, obviously, more work um, to be done. Um, just one of the kind of like a things that I often think about is that UN women, um, reminded us that we is going to take another 140 years on this space to um, achieve gender equality um, of women being in a leadership position at work. It's 2024 now, it's overdue, we don't have the time. So I think the question for all of us, not just the built environment industry, is how do we move um, at, the pace, at, at, the, at the adequate pace um, to reflect that sense of urgency, but also are we moving in the right direction? Um, are we being positive and are we actually, you know, as we're moving, you know, doing all of all of the uh, right things? Because as Jenny said, we've observed that too often a conversation about gender inequality, particularly I'm talking about the um, built environment, gets stuck in, in silos, but also focuses on the problem and on the obstacles. And I feel like we're kind of like always, you know, in that kind of like a real of like, you know, us versus them, what are the problems? And I think that really creates kills our creativity of thinking beyond all of that, like thinking about the future. And one of the reasons why we organized this event is because we actually wanted to flip that story. We wanted to invite us all to imagine that future that we want to live in, to imagine how you know those places where everyone, man, woman, of all characteristics, are feeling, feeling welcomed and empowered, and then maybe work backwards to see how do we arrive to that place. And this is where we invite to the great panel of speakers. Also, just to say all of this work that we did is really in collaboration with many fantastic people. Oh. Many of them are in the room today who inspired and who keep advocating for this. Before I pass on to the fantastic panel, housekeeping works very simple. We are not expecting fire drill, so any alarm, follow. <laughs> <laughs> follow Chelsea. Yeah. And the uh, <laughs> toilet are just there, they're accessible, um, and that's all. Well, thank you very much. Over to you, Dina. Yeah. And there are some free chairs mm -hmm. here. If you need to mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I might just resituate myself slightly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, this will be my chair. Mm -hmm. Can we all meet in that room? Well, I think there is better because you don't have the slide to be uh, on the time. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. No worries. So, but are we okay for the can move, but I can't move her. Should we just have to do that? Yeah, oh, they made it all Thank you. <laughs> okay, my eyes are readjusting. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you to Jenny and Marina for bringing us all here today. Um, so I'm looking forward to this because I was an architect in a past life and moved very, very far away from that life. And sometimes it, it feels uh, quite isolating being in, in academia and only working with, with text really. And so mm -hmm. great to work with people who are in the field, so to speak, and, and see what's happening. Um, I'd like to just first introduce our four panelists and then we'll have about you know, like a 30 minute conversation and I'll ask questions to them and, and hopefully engage a sort of conversation between them and then we can have a bit of Q&A afterward. 
And then after that, we'll be breaking out into the little workshop So I'll start at the far left for me, or right for you. Um, our first uh, panelist is Dr. May Yi. Um, she's an international urbanist specializing in nature positive and gender sensitivities. Her current work involves the use of regenerative design approaches for shaping 20 minute neighborhoods, mining cities, and formal settlements. She is the author of the recently published book, What Is Women Design the City? Very congratulations to you for that, which is based on her PhD research. May was awarded Women of the Decade in Sustainability and Leadership by the Women Economic Forum in 2019. So thank you for your use. Um, our next panelist is Manage Vahid. Um, Manage is the CEO of Open City. Across her career to date, Manage has focused on creating opportunities to widen participation in the making of our built environment. She was the co-creator of the Garden of Privatized Delights at the 2021 British Pavilion and the International Women's Architecture in LA. She was previously head of public engagement at the AA School of Architecture, um, where she also taught a um, master's in the unit. Um, she is currently one of the mayor of London's design advocates and external examiner for the MArch program at Bartlett. She is also on the Board of Trustees for the Architecture Foundation and a member of the Advisory Board for the Disordinary Architecture. Thank you. And this actually, you, you saw it in the right order. <laughs> it's working out very well for me. Um, our next panelist is Anna Rose, um, who leads based in Texas consulting activities in the UK, the US, and continental Europe. Um, Anna has extensive experience in advising both private and public sector clients on spatially complex master projects, with particular focus on the design of effective business behavior patterns. Um, her expertise is in the optimization of spatial layout design, benefit of pedestrians and cyclists, as well as the sustainability of local neighborhoods. Anna is a member of Space and Texas Board of Trustees and Board of Directors. She's also an honorary senior research fellow, also at Bartlett, and an academic position, I don't know how to say that word, <laughs> of the Academy of Urban Education. And the last speaker is Carly Dixon. Um, Carly is an access and inclusive environment consultant at Arab and a certified professional with the Rick Hansen Foundation Disability Certification. Her background is in architecture and design research uh, for aging and intergenerational environments. Carly is also a stakeholder engagement facilitator and teaches engagement processes at the London School of Architecture. Carly was a co-author of the book, Just Living, Homes for Our Future Selves, and author and designer of the report, Design Age Ideas, produced by the Royal College of Arts, Design Age Institute. Thank you, Carly. So I hope all of that <laughs> expertise and background has come through, and we have four panelists with very different perspectives on this topic. So I'm hoping that we can um, bring some new ideas to the table. <clears throat> so I'll first start with um, I actually feeling very uncomfortable in this line. Okay, can we just if it's a conversation, maybe because I can't see them. Okay, maybe, sure. Maybe now that we don't maybe have maybe you in the middle of two come here and then. <laughs> Go on this side and then I'll. It's better for you. Yeah, it's better. So, um, May, we're going to start with you. Um, you recently published your book, and um. Part of the thing that came out in the introduction was this idea of coupling, um, if we think about women in the city, it gets often coupled with safety. And then sometimes the duality of that is that we should think about the city as a liberating space for women. And from what I've read from your work is you've tried to kind of cut through these two binaries that the city is either a space for liberation or a space of fear. So as Wondering if you could expand on how you come up with a, with a different kind of condition regarding these binaries. 
and also link that to your own work on sort of regenerative approaches to the city and explain what that is. So I think as we enter this conversation, it's important that we make one decision and hold some awareness. I believe this awareness are alive in this room, but deal with this point. I think the first, the decision is about not using a node map to store a new territory. This means despite the fact that cities have been planned, designed and built by using men's experience as a reference, we do not adopt a zero sum universe where women's protagonism in urban planning means men or other genders would lose out. Here, we're talking about working alongside men to redistribute power, to balance representation, and to transform planning and legal systems. And I coined this perspective I call co-evolving mutualism, where women and cities are implicated in the construction of one another towards cities that work for all. So this means not using an old map that somebody wins, somebody. So, and then the awarenesses are the first one. I mean, I just came back from, I worked for the UN system for many years. I just came back from the summit for the future. And every time I come from the UN, I come back pregnant of future scenarios. There's so many scenarios ahead of us. If we're going to grow 1.5 centigrades, 1.8 to <laughs> sea level, 15 centimeters. 30. I mean, there's so many projected by uh, big data analysts, futurists, climate scientists, urbanists. If we can synthesize all the scenarios in two. Transition is going to happen. Either we're going to design it or we're going to be victims of it. And we are in the business of redesigning our human presence in the cities. <laughs> so that's an awareness. It's a positive one. We, we are in the business. And design, we, 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 we see design as a collective exercise of imaging, projecting, uh, dreaming together. How are we going to redesign our human presence in the cities? The second awareness, I'm going to be very quick, but I think it's important because it holds the... The second awareness is about direction of travel. <laughs> Sustainability is not enough any longer. How can we sustainably bring back something that we have already lost? So here we have to adopt a regenerative mindset. So whatever intervention we're doing, we're thinking about bringing more life more vitality, <laughs> more viability, which is vitality over time. In this relationship, humans and, 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 and the living systems that support our lives in the cities. Here we start working with lifelines, not with deadlines any longer. <laughs> and the third awareness, so then it's about mindset. Once we start working regeneratively, you let go of what something that you mentioned of a problem solving mindset and instead adopt the notion of potential. Potential that is grounded in the biocultural, spatial uniqueness of place. There's always more potential than has been realized. Problem solving looks backward. Many of us spend our lives waking up in the morning and going back to bed, spending our time only into managing the entropy of failing systems. We don't have time for that. Here is about bringing more life, more vitality in this relationship and start building from what is strong, not what is wrong. Thank you. It's really, um, actually really inspiring to think about <laughs> lifelines. So thank you for, for bringing that to the forefront what we'll, we'll be discussing. Um, so, Ranjay, we'll move to you now. Um, thinking about what May has just brought to the table, um, in your work in participatory processes or platforms or spaces, different community groups, um, how do assumptions about 
uh, women and girls and the city, we can bring in assumptions about problems in the city. Um, how do those change the dynamics of those kinds of conversations? Yeah, I think it's such an important question. And I think part of the reason why I'm here today is because of a very specific project that I was involved with. Um, the, the Mayor of London commissioned Publica to do a piece of uh, guidance on safety in public space for women, girls, and gender diverse people. And as one of the design advocates, um, I was like kind of, I got involved to give them some uh, advice and to be able to kind of be involved in the process of shaping that guidance. And I think in the first meeting, I come from an architecture background. I expected it was going to be a lot of discussion around how do we improve lighting and sight lines and think about visibility. But I think picking up on something that Jenny pointed out in the introduction, I think it's so often, you know, we're trying to take away the, 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 the things that are maybe the lowest common denominator of what makes a place, quote unquote, safe for or how maybe one part of the population perceives what women's safety is. And um, I think Ellie Cosgrave, who led this um, uh, amazing document, which you can download if you can find it on the GLA website, <laughs> um, or I can send a link through and then you can look at it. Um, she started with a quote by Leslie Kahn that says, no amount of lighting can abolish the patriarchy, which um, was a really incredible starting point to think about the fact that we can't solve everything through design alone. And I think as, as May pointed out just now, I think it's, it's not about problem solving, it's actually about listening. And so a big part of the process of making this guidance was really thinking about what is the guidance we need to provide to architects, uh, clients, everyone involved in the built environment to really center the perspectives of women, girls, and gender diverse people. So what are actually ways to listen um, to their experiences, to understand safety as something that is very nuanced, that means different things to different people, that cannot be applied as a one size fits all, that and actually bring women's perspectives into the design process at, at, at multiple points, not just in one. And what was really unique about this project was that uh, there was a first phase where we developed a series of questions that we would ask to different project teams um, to think about like who's in the room when you make decisions, um, what types of engagement um, are you planning? You know, how much budget has been allocated to this? How much, how many resources have been allocated to this? So I met Marina through this process because the LLDC had a series of projects that um, we then ended up testing a lot of these questions um, on. So the London Legacy Development Corporation um, had projects at various stages, but then there were also private developers that had projects and any of the projects that received mayoral funding um, were they were selected to kind of take on board this guidance and see how they could incorporate it into their project, which was uh, quite challenging actually. Some of the projects were already completed, but weren't being used by local women and girls. So it was like looking at what were ways we could activate them. Some of them were just getting started, and we did clienting workshops with, especially we did one with an amazing youth collective that the LLDC had called Elevate to help them. I think about what questions they might ask of a design team that they would bring on board to design a new public space. And in some cases, there was a private development um, very close to the site where Bina Nessa was um, sadly murdered. And um, that was a really crucial site to really think about local women and girls who really experienced or like think about that trauma every day as they move through the city. Mm -hmm. What can we do to make them part of that design process to really open up that public space as a space where they feel safe and can use it? And so um, there were 10 different projects that were tested in the process and the new, um, the second draft of the guidance was just released two weeks ago. And it's very much the beginning of a much longer process, but it's really about empowering women and thinking about the stories we tell about women in public space, which is often one of violence. I think on the call we had when we were preparing for today, we were talking about how, um, I don't know, that like we glorified people like Jack the Ripper um, you know, people go on tours of the city, like from that perspective, and instead, like, how do we center stories of where women have been, uh, like, have achieved things, have shaped parts of the city, um, walking through the city, we should be, like, really celebrating those aspects rather than um, actually centering violence and fear. So I think it's that, that kind of shift from feeling like a victim and um, feeling disempowered to really feeling empowered and that your voice matters is really important. And I think what's crucial in all of this, maybe as a way to conclude this first statement, is that um, 
I don't know that it's not just architects or planners or clients that should have a voice. I think everyone should have a voice in the making of our mm -hmm. cities. And how do we ensure that these processes open up to allow people to realize that we all have agency to do that? Thank you. Something we try to tell our students here that everyone designs the city, mm -hmm. not just the professionals, quote unquote. Um, so Anna, I'm going to move to you as our as our data person. Um, we've heard that we may look at women in the city as a problem. We've heard that we might be prone to measuring light levels in public spaces to understand why a certain place might feel unsafe. Um, based on your experience, what kinds of data do we need to think about this issue in a different way, and how would we go about collecting data and analyzing it. Yeah, so I think it's a really important question because traditionally in architecture, there's very little data about people. So it's all about design, what things look like, the buildings, the physical environment, but actually very little information about the people who use uh, those spaces, if it's in existing spaces or if it's in, in new areas. Um, so my organization, Space Syntax, is coming out of a research department at DCF, at the architecture school. And what they looked at uh, is the impact of the built environment on human behavior patterns. And really understanding the city is not just a physical environment. Mm -hmm. The lifeblood of the city is the people in it. And uh, how we design the city will actually structure the hierarchy of our movements and our activities and also the social patterns which are emerging from the co-presence of different groups of people. So um, if we want to have thriving life um, in cities, uh, in buildings and open spaces, we need to understand these human behavior patterns and how they relate to the things we design. And um, I think there's a lot of data out there and many cities, many places have all this data, but they often don't know what questions to ask. Uh, to the date. Um, so what we try to do is uh, talk with people about what are the outcomes we want to achieve in places and how can we actually uh, use data uh, to, to model design impact. And um, uh, in terms of the uh, data collection and uh, the projects we do, um, so we look both at um, the movement of people in cities uh, but also stationary activities, so what do uh, people do there? Okay. Um, and I think uh, many architects they might go uh, at the beginning of a project with a camera, right, with, uh, take some observations, um, um, kind of qualitative uh, data, let's uh, say, uh, but we can do a lot more than that. So um, we can uh, quantify kind of activities, we can look at different times of the day, uh, different times of the week, what happens in the spaces, we can look at different user groups, we can look at the spatial patterns, how they move in the spaces, how they relate to each other, the social interactions. Um, and in our work, we've been mapping this, and every place is unique. And um, so the methodology and the data might be different. So in one place, you might have a different set of combination of user groups. Um, we've looked at uh, places in London, we often have competing uh, groups. So we have, um, for example, we have uh, local people, uh, tourists, we have office working population, all using the same space um, and using it for different purposes. And really understanding that. And also, when you do this kind of stuff, you also suddenly see what are the areas of behavior happening and things like that. Really helps you to inform a brief of this for the design if you come in early, but also then um, when the design develops, you can use this to check you know, do we accommodate all these needs for these uh, activities we've already observed. And um, I think then uh, this is observed behaviors, but what is also important is to talk to people um, and hear how people feel about the spaces. So even if nothing has happened to, to someone, but if they have Times, for example, the way the space looks and feels when they move through it. If they have this every day, 
then this affects their quality of life as much as actual time as well. So I think the diversity of data sources uh, tailored to the specific place and project and, and objectives and asking the right questions to the data um, is really useful. Nowadays, as you know, I don't want to enter everyone. We have so much data. Can make these observations, but we can also access mobile phone data. We can find out a lot of things uh, about the places, uh, how they how they impact each other. Yeah, yeah, so it's about you know there's a lot of work that has to be done about the way that we approach the data. Yeah, and actually how we synthesize it and the frameworks that we use to publicize it. Yes, yeah. and I think yeah. uh, an issue is that. Um, uh, on a lot of projects, uh, local authorities and in the planning system, what they're looking out for is uh, the volume and activity levels in the spaces. And um, that is sort of material to become an application. You might hear of spaces not having enough capacity, overcrowding, and things like that. So that, you know, mm -hmm. the developers, they need to do that work. But, you know, the kind of more um, detailed questions about what actually happens in space, who are the users, what are their needs. We get to do that work on projects, uh, either they are specifically at the design of that space, uh, as opposed to like a master plan or a wider regeneration plan, uh, or you have a very enlightened client, but it's not the norm or more like the exception. And mm -hmm. I think the uh, uh, policy guidance uh, we've been talking about today will be really important to get more people of more closely. Those. So we'll turn to Carly now. So Carly, you um, are focused on inclusive design with um, an eye for aging in the city. Um, how does your work on an aging population and older people um, being part of the urban life and urban community. How do you bring that knowledge to the conversation about women? It's a good question, and thanks for the amazing uh, remarks so far. It's I think all along the same lines of, of this idea of shifting the mindset from antisocial to pro-social, mm -hmm. and it's so often that. People hear the word antisocial so frequently they don't they may not have never heard the word pro-social before. Mm. And sort of shifting this idea from secured by design to social by design. You know, we don't have that. We have urban greening factors, but we don't have urban social factors. We don't have ways to capture this. And in our work, we think about um, inclusivity across all protected characteristics. Right now, in terms of data, there's there's maybe a lot more um, standards and good practice guidance that might be around certain types of disabilities at the moment, and, and that still needs to grow and fill in the gaps around that. And there might be some other um, guidance that we can look to, but there's a, a big gap in research across all of it, especially across looking at it in an intersectional way that, that we're trying to fill in when we approach design. But it's interesting to think about the age lens and that we're all aging and that we're all, um, I think, thinking of age as a relative thing, where we're all younger or older than somebody else and how we can learn from one another with that. So I've, I've been really lucky to grow up with really meaningful relationships with older people in my life that have been um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years older than myself that I've learned so much from. But then when you look at our urban environments, there's not often that interaction that you see in public and that, not that opportunity to have those chance encounters to create those relationships yourselves if you don't have it already embedded in your family or your friend network. So thinking about how we can design spaces that in, have those choices, those diverse, desirable choices available for us to then meet those people. Is when I when I was in university, I worked with this group that they were called lifestyle leaders. Uh, that they all happened to be over eighty five, and they came together to talk about ways that that the world could be designed better for older people. Uh, but when the students would interact with them, one of them came up to me and said, "You and I have a common enemy." And I was like, "Who?" You know, the middle aged person. <laughs> <laughs> They're always trying to tell us what to do. And it was, <laughs> it was this nice moment of, of realizing that it, it was less about our common age, or it, was, it could have been more about our common interests. And the reason I met that woman is because we were brought together by a common interest of a topic group. 
And can we sort of stop our ageist divides that separate us and think more about actually what are the common interests that unite us across ages, and especially as women, bringing in the gender idea of how can we learn from one another in both directions to rather than proliferate ageism and ableism and sexism and racism and all the other isms, if we can come together as older and younger women to really uh, learn from each other, I think that can only um, help in our shaping of the environment and, and of our experience in, in sort of the, the society itself and looking to how that can help bring in these qualities that, that we were speaking about today. Thank you. I, we have about 10-ish minutes and I'm thinking um, there's a couple of themes that I want to tease out that maybe haven't been addressed that I think we should address. So I'm going to tease them out, and then I think if we could just go around and have your comments on what's happened, and then we can open it up to the board. Does that sound? So I think one of the glaring looking out into the room um, is it doesn't seem like there are many men in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and um, going back to what is talking about it, about this not being a zero sum conversation, but also saying if we design the city from, um, uh, I know that we had this conversation before, but we don't want to say a feminist lens, or I don't know where your position is, but let's say a non patriarchal lens. Okay, so who's actually involved in that? It can't only be the people in this room, and, and how do we, um, you know, articulate what the stakes are? Um, for not having those other people in the room. That's kind of one question I, I wanted to throw out there. The second one is um, thinking through how does this conversation um, reframe how we think about public and private space in the city and where I think that your conversation on public space and women, right? Like. Um, who, which bodies are allowed in which spaces. And we know that, you know, historically there's that dichotomy of men are in public sphere, women are in the private sphere, their social roles in society are spatially designated. Um, but how does this conversation uh, change or, or engage with that kind of evolution? Um, and I mean, just linking to that too, I mean, I was reading a paper preparation for teaching tomorrow and it was going trying to articulate how certain functions of the home are increasingly getting dispersed into the city the way we might eat out in the city or even eat in a public space, for example, mm -hmm. um, and how certain city functions might be bringing into the home the most, you know, prevalent of this is a work from home situation, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> I think just kind of rooting it again back in space, um, these were sort of some of the, the questions that, that sort of I felt that maybe we could tackle a little bit. Um, so I'll start, I'll go back to, to May. Is that okay to start with you? <laughs> yeah, you can, but I thought you could tell us more because you're a master in participatory processes. <laughs> how, <laughs> how, 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 how the first question, you know, I'd like to to get mm -hmm. your wisdom on that. I mean, I think. I think it's often the case that whenever there's an event that is titled something to do with women, only women attend. Um, I've faced this frustration organizing events over the years um, because ultimately change is only possible if we all participate in it. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. I think it's a, it's an interesting thing because, I mean, we talked a lot about language today and how we shift our mindset from a certain type of language into another. Um, but several years ago, I was invited to um, be part of a panel um, as a day-long symposium on the unbuilt that was organized by uh, curator Melody Lung from the Zaha Hadid Gallery. And it was really interesting because it was called the unbuilt. It attracted loads of different people, all different backgrounds. It just happened to be that everyone speaking at the event was a woman and women from different backgrounds, different perspectives. And it was a way to expose people to different role models, different pe people who had lots of things to say. Um, and it didn't, but it didn't frame it through a very obvious lens and I've done that a few times since then because it taught me that you can do lots of events about women in the city but sometimes I don't know why the men feel as though they can't attend these events um, and 
I don't I don't know the work that needs to happen in order for that to change. Um, but in the meantime, I think there is some there's a real power and strength that I get from speaking in spaces that I feel more inclined to participate when I'm in the audience. If sometimes if it's an all woman space, it it creates a safer space. So it's also something that I don't think we need to shy away from as much. But I do think it it's why a lot of this the work that happened with this guidance had to happen. Um, by not staying in the spaces that we already have these conversations in, but actually taking these out into the city and really understanding, like a lot of the decision makers in, in a lot of the projects we were testing this out were never in the rooms we were in. Um, it was something that actually through working on projects with Marina, that having someone who champions and advocates for women at every stage of the process is a crucial part to making this work um, a reality. So it's, you know, who sits in the budget meeting and makes sure that you allocate enough time and money or at least some time and money to um, doing this work and actually getting out into communities, understanding where do women go, how are they adapting their public realm to actually spend time safely within it. Um, and then I think it's also about the creativity that needs to come with it. Um, too often there isn't the budget or the time to do this work. And then um, a, a lot of the time in architectural projects, especially in public realm projects, they're like, well, we can't do it on this project, we'll do it on the next one. And that's just not good enough. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of the role that us as advocates played in these processes was trying to be creative with spaces they already had. Like you're designing a gym as part of your um, development. Why not make a woman's on the hour? Like you have um, a cafe that closes at a certain time. Could, you know, young people use that as a space to hang out and do their homework outside of that? Like, what are the ways we can cross program space and encourage some of the interactions that you were talking about, Carly, like between generations as well? Um, and how do we make care more visible? Like that's, I mean, although, you know, I did say earlier, there's not a one size fits all approach to how you can make spaces more welcoming. Uh, uh, there is a lot of research that says that if you show that someone cares for a space, it's more likely that even if it doesn't discourage people from behaving badly, like it, it actually makes people feel safer. So some of the workshops that we did were like gardening clubs where uh, residents of different ages came together to kind of plant new green spaces that have been created mm -hmm. in relatively new neighborhoods or just like having people tell stories about their favorite memories in a space and like finding ways to install that through public art commissions. So there's, there's, there are ways in which like by centering vo people's voices and care that this can change. I think the frustration is that it's quite slow and I think uh, ways in which to speed this up would be something exciting to talk about. Mm. Yeah. I have two thoughts very briefly to add. One is that image is a metaphor, something about language. I think we're talking about language, changing language. But this metaphor, this there is a movement, there's a, an emerging movement of women in cities mm. that have different names, feminist cities, gender sensitive, Place making there are many faces to that, and the way it is emerging is very different than other movements. Because I I take the the image of the rhizome. Rhizome is a plant that uh, grows horizontally, nearly the surface of the soil, and and have nodes, and it shows up. The nodes right now we experience is so many nodes sprouting all over. <laughs> continent, UK, England, Scotland, you can see. And a, 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 a rhizome doesn't have an end or a beginning. There's not a center. It's not like a tree. A tree has a center with branches and roots, so it's, very, it's, it's different. So I wonder if because it's a movement that is emerging this way, the fact that we don't have men in the room doesn't matter right now because it, at a certain stage it's going to continue to capillarize. And it, because it's at service of all those who live in a community, we should not think, oh, there's no men, so what do we do to engage them? It's going to be interwoven in time. This is a mega trend that started with our you know, the suffragettes, mega trend is a trend that doesn't happen from one year to another. It takes years and decades. We are, reposition of women in society is a mega trend that is taking time. Right now is manifesting itself 
in the relationship with the city through a rhizomatic pattern, which is incredible to be part of one of them. I'm not the center, I'm one of many. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say something. I mean, in, in kind of social movement theory, there's these pros and cons from having, you know, because a decentralized kind of command, because you can multiply the sites of um, contestation and resistance. And then there are organic, um, you know, practices that are context specific, which is, I mean, we can use that to segue to you, because if each place, requires a different data mm -hmm. set, a different way of analyzing it. I would assume some social and historical context. We mm -hmm. don't want to look backward, mm -hmm. but we don't want to negate history either. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, what's your, mm -hmm. your thought I on think this? there's uh, it's often a tendency when a project like, okay, let's start from scratch, scratch it, let's make something new. But I think there's already so much social capital and opportunity in every place because of all these different layers, which makes it unique and can anchor the project in that place in the community and add so much value to it. So it's about making that visible and maybe using data to make that visible. And we, we look a lot at connectivity and it's discussed a lot in the context of mobility patterns and moving people around, but it's always also social connectivity um, that is already there and we can build on. And um, yeah, and I think that that is often just missed in, in big projects and how they set up. Um, so I think um, just by using data to make these things visible, May said we were talking earlier and you said something about counted to be counted. So yeah. I think that's really important. That's really empowering. Um, so there are things already there, and we need to build on them, and that's a huge kind of opportunity, which is often missed. I'm going to bring it to you. What are your reflections? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's so true, that there's often, you know, if there's only time to meet with one group of stakeholder, of, um, local, the local stakeholder group in a project, that's only one community's voice, but there's so many different communities' voices to be heard. And like you're saying, how do we make the time and the space for that in the project that already has a program set? But if we know from the beginning that we that there are these different voices to learn from in order to understand what is all that richness in the local context already, that it's I think that's that's so important to consider. Because for instance, what one thing I really love about the London Legacy Development Corporation's process uh, for design is that they have a built environment access panel. So every project speaks to the, this group that has lived experience of disability. And then I, I learned um, from a, a, a colleague recently that they also, after meeting with Built Environment Access Group, another project that, that same project went to then meet with a group of queer youth in the local neighborhood. And that, you know, there's inevitably going to be things that that are aligned and things that might compete. But those are what you really need to dig into to understand what is going to happen then in the outcome of the project and who's who's living with it and who can enjoy it and who feels welcome in that space. So having that time to meet with all those local voices is so critical for that to be built and for them to be identified because it's not always easy to find those groups and have the time and, and, you, and then the process for how you engage with them in a way that you uh, they, they feel comfortable sharing. And so there's there's so many bits of that process um, to consider. And, and I just also wanted to touch on the, the care point as well because I think it goes along with that in that if we design less for uh, this focus on independence and, and, and maybe more on the idea of interdependence as a society where we, we view interdependence as a positive thing, then that makes us have an easier time, I think, building in those processes that look at how we are interdependent already in a, in a community and how we can add design features that it, it enhance that interdependence in, in a way that we then really value that shared care and informal care that happens in our communities. Yeah. Um, we're 